Okay, let me um, thank you all for coming. Those of you who aren't in the class, those of you who are in the class, thank you for coming too. <laughs> Appreciate it. I am thrilled to introduce Fatima Hassan to you. And those of you who are coming in, there is some coffee and uh, sparkling water in the next room and cookies up here, so help yourself. Fatima is um, a senior attorney and a, the former deputy head of the AIDS Law Project in South Africa. She graduated from law school in 1994 and joined the AIDS Law, law Project in 1996. And in 2000, year 2000, she spent a year with the, the new constitutional court in South Africa as a fellow. And following that year, she was here as an LLM, and that's how many of us here got to know her. Um, and since returning from Duke in 2001, she, had, she has been working with the AIDS Law Project. She is one of South Africa's leading practitioners in AIDS and constitutional law. And it's an exciting place to be practicing in this area. She was named in 2004 by the Johannesburg Mail and Guardian as one of the 20 under 40 year olds to influence the country in the next 10 years, and I have no doubt that she will do that. She's going to talk to us today about the legal struggle to um, access affordable medicines for people with HIV AIDS in South Africa. And welcome, Fatima. And I know she wants questions and discussions, so I encourage you. And have cookies. How long do you want to how long is your class? The class goes, we often take a break halfway through, but the class goes till 10 to 5, but we don't oh. have to go that long. No, we don't. That's what I, mean. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's too long to speak. <laughs> um, I don't think it's too smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Um, just, yeah, thank you for inviting me, and thanks to Carolyn and Catherine Edmay from COSA for co hosting the talk I as well. I to say that. <laughs> That's I apologize. fine. Uh, yeah. But both Carolyn and Catherine are, are very good friends of mine, so we'll just leave all the formal kind of uh, uh, institutional stuff out of the picture and, and just to say it's great to be back at Duke and, and to spend time with both Carolyn and Catherine again. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was. I think, you know, I was asked to give the same talk that I gave in April of this year at the School for Public Policy, but you'll see from the talk that in South Africa a lot happens within 24 hours. So from April up until today, it already feels like a lifetime. So I've had to change the paper considerably just because of the developments that have happened and because of the number of worrying incidents that have happened from April up until now. Um, and mainly it was a few weeks ago when the former deputy Mike is just for the recording. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh. Okay, Can well, you, you just need to speak louder. Oh, okay. Is that better? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so a few weeks ago, the former Deputy Minister of Health in South Africa, I'm sure some of you may, may know about this, her name is Nazizwe Mudlala Rutledge, was dismissed by President Thabo Mbeki as the Deputy Minister of Health. And in my view, I think that her dismissal, among a number of other events in the last 13 years, are very characteristic of the very schizophrenic response to HIV AIDS in South Africa in the last 13 years. Unlike other countries, particularly in Southern Africa, denialism, and that is scientific denialism, has been the most significant aspect of the politics of AIDS in South Africa and our responses there too. So pseudoscience and attacks on evidence have shaped the response of people living with HIV AIDS, of activists, of scientists, of doctors, of nurses, of economists, of actuaries, donors, faith-based organizations, trade unions, business, and the private sector. And more especially, this kind of denialism has influenced the type, the form, and the brand of activist strategies that have been used since 1998 to bring about policy change, with law just being one form of activism and medicine access just being one strand of policy change. So we've had to change the entire policy framework on HIV and AIDS in, and law since 1994 but we've had to do that within the context of a, of, a, of a government that has been in denial. So I've been asked to speak about how we've used law as a tool for social justice in the battle against HIV AIDS, and in particular accessing affordable medicines. Now many of you may know, or not know, but South Africa has one of the highest rates of people living with HIV in the world. We have five and a half million people, or 14% of all adults. So in some provinces, one in four adults are actually living with HIV. One million people today need immediate access to HIV treatment. 
So to be a dispassionate or to be a removed lawyer or to be an objective lawyer is virtually impossible. Now, significantly, unlike other people, Madlala Rutley, who's the former Deputy Minister of Health, has refused to keep quiet after her dismissal. And a few weeks after she was fired, she addressed students and faculty at uh, quite a prominent university in Durban, South Africa. And in her talk entitled The Tradition of Activism, Midlala Rutledg, who herself is an anti-apartheid activist, she's a Quaker and a senior member of the South African Communist Party, spoke about the historical traditions of activism in South Africa with a focus on the role of the African National Congress, the ANC, which culminated in multi-party democratic elections in 94. And she draws two important warnings or lessons for activism and for legal activism. The first is the need for critical engagement, even when democracy exists, such as in South Africa, to bolster democratic traditions. And then, ironically, secondly, the need for real engagement amidst critical engagement. In other words, that unless civil society and human rights lawyers, which are on the one hand critical of government policies, also engages with it, then pro-poor policies will not be introduced or implemented automatically. So which begs the question, and it's something that we find very difficult to do, on a daily basis is how should civil society, which includes lawyers such as myself, respond to a democratically elected government? And while there should be no tension here, you should be able to engage with the democratic government, the, this is perhaps the most schizophrenic and confusing aspect of South African politics and activism, particularly apparent with HIV AIDS and health policy because of state supported denialism. And this aspect is absent in many of South Africa's neighboring countries. It doesn't even exist in Zimbabwe, in Botswana, in Namibia, where they don't enjoy truly multi-party democracy, but ironically, very rarely have to deal with state-supported denialism. So we kind of in a catch-22. So in lobbying, forcing, and litigating for change as lawyers, we have embraced a much wider definition of civil society. So in my definition, I would include non-state actors such as scientists, who have been significant in, in our battles, public health care workers, particularly doctors and nurses who work in state facilities, medical and scientific researchers, economists, economists um, actuaries, and donors, particularly those implementing programs in communities, and ironically, PEPFI is one of our greatest allies, and finally, in some cases, the private and the business sector as well. So while the business and private sector and sort of international donors such as PEPFAR are not ordinarily considered as civil society actors in other countries, in South Africa, they've played a significant role in sustaining pressure on the South African government to introduce and scale up prevention care and treatment services, and in some cases actually assisting government to do so. So while such inclusion in civil society alliances is contentious and you know, sometimes quite complex, these alliances have been crucial in ensuring, for example, the, the introduction of ARV treatment in South Africa in the workplace before the South African government even introduced ARVs in the public sector. So in South Africa, democracy and rule of law exists. It defines a space in which civil society or non-state uh, actors exist to operate. And our experience of post-1994 activism, which is when apartheid ended, is very different to countries in Southern Africa where one party, lifelong presidents or unelected monarchies still rule. So for example, Swaziland, Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe. To put it bluntly, unlike many other Southern African um, countries and activists, we as activists in South Africa are simply allowed to be activists. In countries such as Zimbabwe and some Eastern European countries, there's very little political or other space for pro-democracy, civil society, or single issue based organizations to exist. In South Africa, activists, including lawyers, are given a safe space to do so. And where activists have been arrested, it's because we wanted to be arrested. So it wasn't any kind of abuse of state power. Aside from a few police and citizen skirmishes involving tear gas, batons, rubber bullets that have been used against us, we're not detained without trial. We're not refused bail, we're not tortured, we're not assassinated, and nor are we physically attacked if we are critical of government policy or the president of South Africa, Dabo Mbeki. But when attacks by the South African government do occur, and they do personal attacks against people that I work with, against the organizations I work for, and, and myself individually as well, they've been disingenuously carried out with words and COVID attempts to marginalize and undermine the personal reputation of civil society activists either on the basis of race, so you're white, you don't know what, what black people are going through, sex, 
well, you are men and you don't know what women are going through. Class, well, you middle class and you don't know what poor people are going through. Or funding sources, well, you're, uh, you, you're the Trojan horse of the drug uh, cartel. Or in my case, accused of, of sometimes being part of the rational faction of the treatment action campaign and at other times of not grounding my criticism of the slow pace of the ARV rollout uh, in science and evidence. The irony of this attack on us of not basing our criticism in science and evidence is that science and evidence have been the backbone of all of our lobbying policy and litigation battles. We wouldn't have been able to get to the point where we are without science and evidence. So ironically, it has been civil society more than government that has invoked science in all of our battles. In all of our campaigns, whether they're on civil and political rights, or whether they're on confidentiality or discrimination, or whether they're on socioeconomic rights, access to heavy treatment services, access to health facilities, even before we invoke rights, or even we, before we pursue litigation in a court of law, scientific evidence, research, personal testimonies, and actuarial research heavily influence the outcome of policy decisions. So human rights, politics, activism, and science all collide to result in policy shifts, with law and lawyers only entering the fray if it does not. So your law for us is often the last resort. But these techniques are not new. It's not something we developed after 94. Nonviolent civil disobedience, information sharing through mass meetings, symbolic protests, sit-ins, including uh, peaceful civil disobedience, broad-based local alliances, the use of HIV t-shirts, uh, protest songs, posters, vigils, naming and shaming, reliance on research and expert evidence, the use of personal testimonies, nonviolent marches, petitions, international alliance, lobbying, appeals to international bodies and governments, you name it. Including the use of the legal machinery and courts of law through class actions and use of the media and an appeal to citizen participation. These are tools that we've always used and we've used them during the anti-apartheid struggle. But the irony again is that unlike countries such as Thailand and Brazil, these tools have been used on two fronts in South Africa, obviously against the multinational drug industry, which is bent on making excessive profits, not reasonable profits, but they've also been used against a democratically elected, legitimate African National Congress government. And I think that's the schizophrenic aspect that we're trying to deal with. So what has all these battles and fights and lobbying and litigation led to? Well, a few years later, and, the, and our organization was formed in 93, the Treatment Action Campaign was formed in 1998, we're now aiming to treat one million people with ARVs by 2011. Through donor and not-for-profit sector support and healthcare workers' commitment, we've put 350,000 people on treatment in the public sector and about 150,000 people on treatment in the private sector. In what is quite, again, crazily schizophrenic, we have the largest program of people on ARV treatment in the world in terms of numbers. So everything looks fine from the outside and on paper, but we're the slowest in terms of pace. So even a country such as Rwanda, which is dealing with the post-genocide uh, history, is faster with putting people on ARVs than South Africa with all of its infrastructure, resources, and skills. Even Botswana is outpacing us. And in terms of access to medicine, our battles just rage on, whereas the Botswana government, the Namibian government, and even the Rwandan government and Brazil and Thailand more recently have been more forceful on that aspect. So perhaps on the face of it, if you're looking as an outsider and you see we have the largest treatment program in the world, it looks like we found the light and that the president has changed his tune and everything is, is quite okay. But the sting in the tail is that despite the enviable political space that we occupy and the historical tradition of activism, including legal activism that we've inherited, the space has become dominated by an unnecessary battle against denialism, <coughs> which fuels suspicion and tension and on some occasions even hostility. So even legal victories and important constitutional clarifications on the right to health by the Constitutional Court, which develop our legal jurisprudence and socioeconomic rights, those judgments are tainted with mistrust and with fear and with suspicion. So while we have all the tools of democracy at hand, especially free speech, most of our activities, most of the legal work we do, most of our spaces for free speech is used to attack the battle that's mounted by a few senior ranking and decision making officials in the South African government, including the president and the minister of health, against evidence-based medicine and intervention. Then you'll see I've chosen very carefully not to use the word medicine, Western medicine versus traditional medicine, because that's not actually the battle. The battle is between evidence-based interventions and non-evidence-based interventions. 
So to practice law is one thing, and I, but I think to find denialism amidst doing law is, is quite another. And then, you know, I mean, as a lawyer who's been doing this work for 12 years, I'll be the first to admit that law and legal victories in South Africa is not all that it's trumped up to be. It's a limited tool for bringing about social justice. And because AIDS in South Africa is such a highly inherently political issue, the changes in the last few years that have taken place, so ARV treatment for rape survivors, for pregnant women, and for people living with HIV, whether through lobbying or litigation or mass civil disobedience, has been brought about by a very nuanced understanding of this political terrain and the deployment of a variety of strategies to influence it. So the strategies, even though they seem quite disparate, they're designed to act cohesively to influence the politics of HIV and AIDS. And the overall strategy of, of, of lawyers and of civil society groups can best be classified as a collection of a number of micro strategies acting in tandem with an understanding that power in South Africa is not located in any one particular place, but a number of different sites, ranging from the more obvious, such as courtrooms, the media and parliament, but to the more discreet but equally effective sites such as universities, townships, and streets. And as lawyers, we've been successful in changing the policy on AIDS to some extent over the last few years because we've understood that power doesn't operate in a predefined center such as parliament or the courtroom, but is just as present in the so-called peripheries such as the streets, local organizations, and council. So I think let's look at these sites of struggle. Again, South Africa is unique for all the wrong reasons. Virtually every aspect of the epidemic, from AIDS statistics to theories about the causal link between HIV and AIDS, to studies on AIDS drug therapy, has led to contestation between government on the one side and AIDS activists, scientists, health professionals, and the media on the other. As AIDS activists, we've relied on mobilization, struggle activism, and the courts to effect policy change. But science, research, and evidence have been the greatest ally in the struggle against AIDS in, uh, and denialism in South Africa. Law, by and in itself, and I can tell you, uh, you'll learn this in, in your next few years of practicing law, has not brought about social justice by and in itself, and it's unlikely to. It's acted as a catalyst, definitely, for action of policy shifts, but it's not forced denialists to stop being denialists, and it's not ensured that people will take their medicines every day, which they need to. Neither does it create political world by judicial order. So without evidence and without the science, coupled with researchers and doctors who on a daily basis are willing to defend their data and finance, because that's what they have to do in South Africa, they don't have to do that anywhere else in the world, activists would not have been able to force policy reform or ensure access to prevention, care and treatment services, or win some of our most important legal cases. And so strategic alliances with healthcare workers and professional medical organizations are vital. But this is not something new to AIDS activism. Even during apartheid, a very small but progressive part of the medical professional establishment supported the anti-apartheid struggle. Several of them um, were detained by the apartheid police and either tortured or, or killed in detention. Several exposed and challenged the deaths and injuries of political detainees and vehemently opposed the biochemical program. And these doctors, scientists, and researchers now form the backbone of South Africa's very illustrious and internationally renowned and acclaimed scientific and medical research community, many of whom ironically still were ANC members and still are ANC members. And the irony is that a lot of our scientists and researchers are regarded as world class by international organizations. So they're at the forefront of microbicide research, of male circumcision research, on research on prevention of mother to child transmission. But their data and findings are relied upon and used by activists and governments in other countries, not by the South African government. And it's something that came to the fore when we took government to the Constitutional Court on providing MTCT services where they challenged the efficacy of navarapine. And we had to bring in a whole lot of research and scientists, researchers and scientists from South Africa to counter that kind of state denialism. And I think, you know, when Nazizu Madala Rutledge was dismissed, it was because of this growing infant mortality crisis that we're now experiencing in South Africa. So AIDS is just one of the critical health issues. There's a number of others that we have to deal with. And the recently exposed crisis at, at a hospital in the Eastern Cape, which is a province in South Africa, which was really the catalyst for her dismissal because she was outspoken about it, is a case in point. Two doctors have been suspended for speaking to the media at that hospital. And the trend of state power being used to silence health workers is now gaining momentum. A few months ago, a doctor was suspended from employment for speaking to the media about poor health conditions 
of prisoners living with HIV and the lack of proper AIDS treatment at a very big prominent correctional facility in the Western Cape. So admittedly, denialism in state interference not only affects my job as a lawyer, but it affects the job and the livelihoods of healthcare workers as well. The state kind of abuse of power and interference has contributed to the attrition of healthcare workers in South Africa and professionals. We have a massive human resource crisis, and they've either left the public sector to join the private sector, or left the, private se left the public sector to leave the country to join international organizations. So we've lost some of our most committed public sector do doctors, nurses, policy makers, researchers and scientists because of low morale. In fact, special advisors to the Minister of Health have subsequently left South Africa to work for international organizations instead of staying in South Africa. So I think that this kind of context will ex you know, illustrate to you how difficult it is to actually lobby and litigate for drug access. And, and at the same time, while it's difficult, it's also quite unique because it's difficult because it's very, um, it's almost impossible to lobby a drug company to lower its price of a particular ARV medicine if our own government shows no political leadership on the issue because they believe that those drugs are going to kill you because they're toxic, okay? Yet at the same time, it's unique because even though we're targeting, pressurizing, naming and shaming multinational drug companies like GlaxoSmithKline, Boring, Ingelheim, and in the next few weeks, we bring in a case against Merck, Sharp, Dome, and against Abbott, in many cases, those very drug companies and the private sector and the multinational companies have been our allies in the battle against denialism and have been our allies to actually push forward evidence-based intervention. So it's quite, again, very schizophrenic. So I think on medicines and the struggle to stay alive and be productive, because that's really what medicines do. They allow you to, to stay alive for a longer period than if you didn't have access to ARVs. Law, among many other tools, has genuinely saved thousands of lives. So the kind of work we do has an immediate e effect in people's sort of uh, daily livelihoods and they're able to live. People who live near a public hospital or who can afford transport to a health facility and know their HIV status are more likely to benefit from the provision of ARVs than they did four years ago. Four years ago, you just couldn't get ARVs in a public facility. And the law has played a significant part in making that possible. But the single biggest threat to ensuring that one million people will be on treatment in the next few years is access to continued, sustainable, affordable, life-saving medicines and access to second-line ARV regimen. Many patients will have to si switch to second-line drugs and many more patients will be initiated on first-line regimens through the public, not-for-profit and the private sector because you're going to put another 800,000 people on treatment in the next five years. So this is why the premise that we work from as lawyers and as activists in South Africa is that generic competition is essential, not only for ensuring competitive prices, but also for ensuring, one, that stockouts don't occur, occur and that government is not dependent on a single supply of any drug. So in cases where we were procuring efavirenz only from MSD, because at the time it was the only uh, company that was manufacturing the drug and it had not issued any licenses to any other generic companies, where there were stockouts of efavirenz, the country was basically at a standstill and its hands were tied, because one company couldn't supply nine provinces with enough stock of efavirenz. And I think that when and because our government has refused to take measures to ensure the state use of essential life-saving drugs and measures that the Canadian government has taken, measures that the American government has taken, particularly after 9-11, the job to ensure sustainable access to medicines in South Africa has become ours. It's something that should be done by the state, but because of the political context and denialism, we are the ones that are doing its work for it. And all of the AIDS uh, medicine access work and the legal battles against drug companies that has taken place in South Africa have been through the efforts of civil society. The TAC and its international partners such as Medicines on Frontiers, ACT UP, Oxfam and the Consumer Project for Technology in Washington DC. And this is very different to the medicine access work that is being done in Thailand and in Brazil right now where civil society and government actually work together to put pressure on multinational companies to license, to, to issue licenses and reduce prices. And recently what happened in Thailand, uh, where the Thai government decided to take action against MSD on efavirenz is I think a case in point. So while we have this great constitutional jurisprudence where we've entrenched the progressive realization of socioeconomic rights, where our courts have recognized that the right to health includes the right to access to medicines, um, which really has been the reason why pregnant women can access 
uh, PMPCT facilities, why sexual assault survivors can get uh, post-exposure prophylaxis and people can get ARV treatment. In other countries who don't have that kind of constitutional jurisprudence, particularly Thailand, where they've inherited a military government, a lot more movement has been done on policy and on prevention, treatment, and care on HIV, which I think is, is quite ironic. So I think, you know, just to be wrapping up, I think we have to ask what does winning really mean? Because people will say, yeah, South African activists, and they've won all these great legal victories, and isn't this fantastic? You know, I mean, look, look at this country. They've got 350,000 people in treatment. They've got this great constitution of jurisprudence. It's really a model for Africa because democracy is really working in South Africa. I think that many people who have written about the South African experience and many commentaries about, about South Africa and the legal victories ignore the nuances of what civil society has really accomplished by not fully unpacking the outcomes of legal victories. So for example, let's take the PMA case, which you all must know about of 2001, the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association case, which was brought against Nelson Mandela and the government of South Africa during his term. And that's really the first phase of medicine activism that, that directly used all the tools that we learned during the anti-apartheid movement um, to challenge uh, multinational power. So 39 multinational pharmaceutical companies brought a case against the South African government. After three years, withdrew its legal claim against the government. And the case was then celebrated as a victory for civil society and transnational activism. And ironically, it was celebrated by the South African government. They had a victory rally. And ironically, they didn't invite us to the victory rally, which was held, I think, the next day. But it was celebrated by the South African government as an indication of its own commitment to secure affordable medicines for people in need. Now, most commentators leave it at that. But let's look at what happened after the case was withdrawn. So the South African government then consist consistently refused to acknowledge the role of the Treatment Action Campaign and its international ally uh, allies in bringing international and local attention to a lengthy three-year court battle which was withdrawn six weeks after we intervened as a friend of the court in Amicus Curiae. Government opposition, I think, and the dislike of, of civil society activists and of lawyers who are doing HIV AIDS is, is one thing, but its revisionism recently is quite startling. So if you look at any account of this particular case and what has happened on HIV AIDS policy reform in South Africa, which is written by a government official, you will notice that we just don't exist. We've just been written out of history. Okay, which is the one disadvantage of being an amicus curiae. You're not a party to the proceedings. We don't know whether they agreed with the pharmaceutical companies. The settlement withdrawal offer or whatever uh, agreement was never made public. We simply don't know what they agreed to. I personally think they agreed that we would leave you alone for 10 years. Withdraw your case now because there's too much international pressure and we won't touch you for another 10 years. And I'll explain to you why I think that. So even though the case is credited with catalyzing um, international action in the form of the Doha Declaration. In South Africa, it did not translate into policy reform on medicine access, still hasn't, and certainly didn't result in the immediate provision of ARVs in the public sector. <coughs> so crucially, South Africa failed to issue compulsory licenses, and up until today has not issued a compulsory license on any AIDS medicine, in fact, on any other medicine, it has not invoked the flex flexibilities permitted to it through the Doha Declaration. It has not threatened to invoke compulsory license. It has not threatened to take action against drug companies for not reducing prices, despite 5.5 million people living with HIV, where 1 million people need immediate access to HIV treatment. So if this is not a public emergency, then I'm not sure what is. To date, the government has not entered publicly into any negotiations with any drug companies on prices or licensing agreements, leaving civil society and lawyers such as myself to do the work for it. And similarly, even though the current contract for state drugs will expire in a few months, in February 2008, it's unclear if our government has any strategy in place to ensure lower competitive prices, to ensure the ability to procure generic versions where possible. So pressure, legal or otherwise, in the next few months for it to do so will have to be exerted by civil society. So since 2001 and the announcement by the international pharmaceutical industry and Kofi Annan's role in making sure the pharmaceutical industry would withdraw its case, the South African government, on the other hand, has not taken any formal steps against any of the companies that belong to the pharmaceutical industry to lower the prices of medicines. 
So I'm not suggesting that the withdrawal of the, of the claim and the advocacy and the amicus curiae intervention in the PMA case was not significant for global access medicine advocacy. It did more for Thailand and Brazil than it did for South Africa. It did more for Botswana, Namibia, Rwanda, and the rest of Africa than it actually did for South Africa. But the withdrawal of the case came with certain expectations for us in South Africa. And in my view, they have not been met. So for these reasons, so for example, it took over nine years for government to implement the law that it took three years to fight for, which is why I said they must have agreed with the drug companies that they wouldn't take any action against them. We still don't have a transparent pricing system. We've just introduced a single exit price. Um, so really, any kind of pressure, whether regulatory or otherwise, on the, on the pharmaceutical industry has been very slow uh, in materializing and has really not taken place in any kind of effective manner. So for these reasons, there have been two components of medicine activism in the last six years. The first aspect involves challenging the South African government on its own refusal to make ARVs in the public sector, something that most developing countries didn't have to deal with. They could immediately jump into the struggle against drug companies to make the drugs more affordable. We first had to deal with our government and its denialism. And then the second aspect involved challenging multinational companies on pricing and licenses for the generic manufacture and production of ARP medicines. So for example, I'll, I'll just give you two, two cases that we've worked on campaigns. The one was a breaking the law campaign. So as lawyers acting in a country with democracy where government is legitimate, where you have rule of law, we decided to break the law. Okay, which again is, is, is a spin on a Gandhian form of civil disobedience. And civil society forced one of the largest drug companies, one of the most profitable, Pfizer, through a patent defiance campaign to donate a drug to treat a common and life-threatening opportunistic infection. What had happened was you get a drug called fluconazole, which, which, which basically treats an opportunistic infection called esophageal thrush. If you get esophageal thrush and you don't treat it immediately, your immune system collapses and you will die quite quickly. The drug was not being made available in the public sector. And to buy the drug in the private sector was extremely expensive, especially for people who had no jobs or had very little income. Uh, the treatment action campaign went to Thailand, bought the generic equivalent of a couple of US cents a day, which is called Biazol, brought it publicly using the media. It was announced widely internationally to South Africa in violation of our patent laws, because you know if there's a patent which is held on a particular drug in the country, you can only bring a generic version of it with the authorization and permission of the patent holder, which was Pfizer. And they were obviously not going to agree to it. But created large publicity, walked into the airport, Zaki Ahmed, the chairperson of the treatment action campaign, brought hundreds of, of capsules of biodol and said, arrest me if you want. But these drugs are now going to be given to people. They were bioequivalent, they had met WHO pre-approval, so we weren't bringing in unsafe drugs or drugs that were going to damage people's immune system. That could have resulted in two things. And here again, it's creative and strategic use of the law. In, our, in terms of our Patents Act, you allowed it's a provision which obviously Pfizer knew about, which is why they didn't sue us for patent infringement to counterclaim against the company for, st for basically for public use. So had they sued us, we would have been able to counterclaim and say, well, it's in the public interest. There's no other manufacturer or supplier. We actually want, we want government to issue a compulsory license. So they obviously didn't sue. And the spin-off from that particular campaign with the embarrassment and the naming and shaming of Pfizer was they decided to donate the drug for free and still do for the last seven years in the public sector in South Africa. So thousands of patients are now benefiting from, from getting free fluconazole because Pfizer's choice was, well, do we want them to use a generic equivalent or with our own branding and the amount of money we spent on the image for Pfizer, we'd rather let them use our products. So now we get to use both. The second legal case that we did was we realized that at the time you could only access treatment in the private sector. The South African government only started providing ARVs in 2004. If you were poor, if you were a domestic worker or a gardener, you simply would die because you wouldn't be able to afford the medicines in the private sector. They were excessively priced. Okay. And three of the drugs which were critical to a first-line regimen to, to a person whose immune system just dropped below 200 was AZT, 3TC, and Nevirapine. And the companies that are responsible for that are GlaxoSmithKline and Boringa. GlaxoSmithKline for AZT and 3TC and Boringa Ingeline for Nevirapine. So realizing that our government would never take any action, even though it had won this 
legal victory against a pharmaceutical multinational industry in 2001, <laughs> realizing that it would not, or it would take ve a very long time for it to provide ARVs in the public sector, we decided to sue GlaxoSmithKline and Boehringer Ingelheim, but not using constitutional uh, provisions, not relying on our constitutional provisions in a direct sense, indirectly through the back door, used antitrust legislation and use a piece of law which is called the competition law in South Africa, which is the equivalent of antitrust law in, in the US, and took GlaxoSmithKline and Boehringer to the competition commission in South Africa and said, poor person, sick, can't afford your drugs, going to die, versus what you're charging, versus what generics are charging, you're making an excessive profit. We're not challenging your patent, we're not saying you shouldn't make a profit, but you've got to make a reasonable profit, not an excessive profit. Okay, obviously, went on for a year, it was investigated, no drug company will ever want anything to go to any kind of adjudicated tribunal. Because one of the things we had done was we said, we think this is what you should be charging for your drug, but you're charging 15 times more. But perhaps you can come and tell us what your true costs are and your real R&D research and development costs. And maybe then, if we have a transparent pricing system, we can see whether you're undercharging or overcharging. So, how about coming and giving us the information? No drug company is ever going to do that. So within a year, in a world first, they decided to settle the case, both companies, and unlike the South African government, they have good legal advisors and they knew when they had to settle and not pursue a case just for the sake of it, and granted multiple voluntary licenses. So before the case, there was only one license to one company in South Africa at a 25% royalty. No exports to Sub-Saharan Africa could not be used for fixed dose combinations, so you couldn't use it in combination with any other product. After the settlement, multiple voluntary licenses to at least three companies, we could get three generic versions in. We could export to Sub-Saharan Africa because we've always done um, medicine access work where we don't just worry about what's happening in South Africa, but we worry about what's happening in the rest of Africa as well. And at a reasonable royalty of 5%, which is basically what the Canadians use when they issue licenses as well. Um, and in the next few weeks, we're planning to do the same against Smoke Shop in Doma Mifeverance and against um, Abbott on Kalitra. Now, MSD is interesting because they've heard that we're preparing legal action, and that's one of the great things about doing legal activism is you can send emails and create international pressure. And they had only issued one license to the one company that always gets the licenses. It's a company that locally manufactures drugs, and most of their shareholders are ANC members. So obviously that company gets all the licenses. Um, but when they heard that we were taking the, the, uh, this uh, possible legal action, they issued another license. Um, so already, without even lodging papers, we were able to secure a second license. And hopefully by the time we lodge papers, they'll realize that they have to issue at least three or four licenses. Uh, given that it's the most expensive drug in South Africa and two thirds of patients are on an evidence based regimen, it's a battle that we're not going to going to give up easily and be happy with two licenses. So, I mean, finally, I think that we do this work, and I would be out of a job if my government was more rational and reasonable. We do this work because our government refuses to do it, uh, despite the resources that it has, despite the technical skills, the infrastructure, the financial resources, the donor support that it gets, and the scientific and uh, research community that it can benefit from. It prefers quiet diplomacy, and for those of you who know what's happening in Zimbabwe, this is quite a politically controversial term. But that quiet diplomacy on HIV AIDS with drug companies doesn't really translate into real action. So sitting and having a nice discussion with people around the table is not going to get people uh, access to medicine. So I think the, for want of a better word, and Mike Merson call, uh, calls it the deleterious conduct of the South African government, um, but really, I would say the murderous conduct of the South African government, they really do have blood on their hands. Um, that conduct, coupled with the recent dismissal of the, of the Deputy Mis Minister of Health, is again ironically juxtaposed with the very new, very renewed paper-based commitment. I say paper-based because we still have to see whether it will be implemented to a multi-sectoral response to AIDS. So we have a new national strategic plan on HIV AIDS, which we all participated in drafting that particular document. It really is multi-sectoral, uh, and it really sets targets for the first time in South Africa on prevention, care, and treatment, which is something of a victory just by and in itself, because the Minister of Health at every international meeting, whether it's at the WHO or at UNGAS or at Abuja, has always opposed the setting of targets, because it's something to hold her accountable to. 
Um, so we have this new paper-based commitment to a multi-sectoral response. The deputy president, fortunately, is now in charge of the AIDS program through the South African National AIDS Council, no longer the Minister of Health. The South African National AIDS Council is important because it's the country coordinating mechanism for the Global Fund. So the deputy president's leadership in that particular structure is quite critical. But the minister still continues to sow confusion and distrust. Uh, two weeks ago, another scandal broke out about the president and the minister's involvement in research trials, unauthorized research trials on an industrial solvent called Virodine. Those trials should not have been taking place. The researchers, we think, were getting direct support from the president's office and the minister. Trials were continued in Tanzania, despite the Tanzanian government saying that the trials should be ended. We've called for a public commission of inquiry. I'm sure that will not happen. Um, and then at the same time, the South African National AIDS Council, for the first time in its history, has just appointed its first deputy chairperson from civil society, who happens to be my boss. So it's formally elected by civil society, is working under, directly under the deputy president of South Africa, who is the chairperson of the South African National AIDS Council. So go figure. The space, I think, for constructive and critical engagement with the state through SENEC, the South African National AIDS Council exists. But I think years of battles, battle scars, and mistrust, and, and just a cynicism, makes even the most committed lawyers, I think, wary and cynical. And the increased abuse of state power, however legitimate a government may be, so suspending doctors, not allowing them to speak to the media, firing people for speaking the truth, uh, firing the Deputy Minister of Health because she said there's an infant mortality crisis and then you say she took unauthorized travel so you fire her is, is a problem and I think an indication of abuse of state powers. It may be, you know, it may just be a concern for health right lawyers but I think it has to be a concern for all people interested in a truly free society and if South Africa is really the model for democracy and democracy making in Africa, then I think a lot of attention has to be paid to this aspect of the abuse of state power. I'll end there. Thank you. Would you entertain some questions? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Good for her, so. Or can't leave, yeah. <laughs> sure. No, okay. Um, I had a question on, I guess, um, if you could explain a little bit more about the cultural context and why you think the government is so resistant, um, what aspects, perhaps cultural or religious, that make the government um, not want to address this issue or confront it? Do you want me to do one at a time or? Yeah. Take yeah. One at a time. I think. That's probably the most difficult question to answer because there is no easy answer. On the one hand, you know, an immediate response would be, well, you have a president who's, who, who grew up and studied in exile. Okay, there's a great documentary which has caused a lot of controversy in South Africa about the unauthorized biography of President Timbeki and why he sees himself as an intellectual and a contrarian. Okay, so in every aspect of his management of South Africa and the South African uh, whether it's economic policies or political spaces, he's been the contrarian within the ANC and sort of sees himself as a person who challenges notions of black sexuality, Western notions of black sexuality, Western notions of sexual practices of black people, and continuously defending African men. So a lot of times in his postings on what's called the ANC online, he does a once a week sort of letter or, you know, commentary on, on what's been happening in the week. It's issues around, well, you see, the stats are not really as high as it is because people are attacking um, the sexuality of black men. Not all black men are going to infect other people with HIV. Not all black men have multiple sexual partners. So culture is sometimes used an as an excuse to warrant his own particular unique view of HIV and AIDS. I mean, I think that there is no cultural reason to explain the denialism. It has nothing to do with culture or black sexuality or race relations in South Africa, which often he tries to invoke to hide that. It really has to do with the fact that this man does not believe that HIV causes AIDS. And he doesn't believe that HIV causes AIDS for two reasons. One is a number of den what are called in, in the US dissidents or denialists from the US and other parts of Europe have come to South Africa and have been 
in South Africa since 1994 and have been able to influence the president in his thinking around HIV AIDS. So he, unlike other African presidents, formed something called the Presidential Advisory Panel, where literally this half of the room was made up of scientists, researchers who believe that HIV caused AIDS, and this half of the room was made up of these dissidents and denialists who didn't believe that HIV caused AIDS. So eventually the panel couldn't come to any consensus and he still harbors these sort of uh, views that there is no causal link between HIV and AIDS. If you look at every press statement issued by the South African government on HIV AIDS, when President Mbeki has been challenged on his view, it says we work from the premise that HIV causes AIDS and that is the official policy of South Africa. So there's still a lot of sinister um, you know, maneuverings, I think, behind the scene. So I don't think there's an easy answer. We've all tried to battle why a very bright, educated, intelligent man who's regarded as a leader in the rest of Africa is so caught up in this denialism and really believes this. And Kabir is going to say I'm going mad again. So I'm going to try and be as objective as possible. <laughs> okay. Kabir is not too much part of yeah. <laughs> there, there, there are three <laughs> books Lincoln. that you should read. The one is the unauthorized or deauthorized biography of Nadine Godimer, who the Nobel uh, Literature Laureate, um, which was written by the person who's now done the authorized biography of President Mbeki Ronald Suresh Roberts. And read the chapter on the TAC and on AIDS in South Africa. TAC okay, is yeah. But actually, don't buy the book. Just mm -hmm. try and read it in the bookshop or whatever. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't want to support that denialist kind of things. And there's another book by He's this. He's an American, by the way. He's Trinidad, yeah, from Trinidad. With an American yeah. passport. Yeah. And then. Um, there's William Gomere, the, the Battle for the Soul of the AZ, President Beck and the Battle for the Soul of the AZ, which deals exactly with your question about, well, what is the cultural context and is there any kind of cultural explanation for why these views are actually quite prevalent? Uh, and also tries to unpack a lot of these things and, and can't come up with any kind of you know, plausible answer. And the third is Liz McGregor's book on a famous uh, DJ, a radio disc jockey, young person called Gabzella, who subsequently died because he stopped taking his ARVs, was convinced by a person who was sent by the Minister of Health to take a remedy that was uh, developed and concocted by a, a woman from uh, the Netherlands called Tina van der Maas, who's very active in South Africa, and that's the lemon, garlic, and olive oil uh, concoction that, that most of you must have read about. And, you know, I think what Liz McGregor's book is probably the best uh, illustration of how confusing this cultural context we're we in because it talks about Kabzella who was employed, was very famous, was earning a lot of money, his employer was paying for his ARVs, uh, but came up from, um, a, lived in a township, was brought up by his mother who was a single mother, uh, was, was, had a very poor sort of um, low income upbringing. His mother's a nurse but also a Jehovah's Witness okay, living in an African township in South Africa and the reasons and how culture, I think, interacts with people's own kind of uh, politics and their personal spaces into making certain decisions where you would actually stop taking ARVs and start taking ARV medicines. And it's so easy to become a denialist in South Africa because it's very easy to discredit organizations that are promoting ARVs by saying they're funded by drug companies. People will believe that. And it's very easy to discredit ARVs because they have side effects. So, you know, a lot of people are stopping the ARVs because they believe that this is a plot by Western companies and, and the Western world, and especially America, to make us more sick. And we will use our traditional medicines and our traditional remedies, which admittedly for a long time has been ignored and has been discredited by m the mainstream scientific establishment. And for that reason, people believe it's a long answer to your question, but they believe they're sort of on the defense, so they're trying to defend traditional medicines and remedies from Western medicines, which is why I use the word evidence-based intervention. So some traditional leaders are promoting little remedies and cures, but a lot of traditional leaders in South Africa are actually saying we want evidence-based interventions and are working with us to take their patients for CD4 testing and to get them on ARV. So they do the spiritual healing and we do the medical healing. So no... No easy answer. I do think that patriarchy, I don't know if that's cultural, but patriarchy and religion are probably some of our greatest challenges to overcome because the culture of patriarchy is so prevalent that we have the highest levels of intimate partner violence and abuse as well as um, 
uh, murder. And we have high increasing levels of sexual abuse and assault of young girls in South Africa. Because there is a myth that if you rape a virgin, you will be cured of HIV AIDS. We initially thought that that was anecdotal evidence, but it seems that that seems to be quite uh, growing in, in popularity as a particular perception. And, and generally, I think a very dehumanized society that came out of apartheid where women are just not respected. Whether that's patriarchy, whether that's apartheid, whether that's religion, I think it's a combination of all, all three. Um, makes women in South Africa increasingly vulnerable and, and makes government to, to be in denial about the fact that most women who are being raped are black and most sexual offenders are actually black. That's because of the demographics of our country, because we have a larger black population than any other race group. So I, I think it's a lot, it's very complex and it's something that they're struggling to grapple with. Um, so you seem to describe the administration as being sort of schizophrenic, like, and some of their beliefs seem crazy to me, frankly. Would you say that um, the courts are different from that? Or and how and why do you think that is? I mean, the courts have been remarkable in, in the battle against HIV AIDS, and I think for two reasons. The one is that we have a constitutional court made up of 11 judges, okay, and <coughs> whose tenure is not, I don't think necessarily, maybe Catherine disagrees with me, is not necessarily directly dependent on whether the president likes you or not. It may be, I think, in the next 10 years, because certainly we've seen that, but, but somebody who's done HIV AIDS cases for us as an advocate hasn't been appointed to the high court because the high court appointment uh, process is, de is determined by the president. His name is Jeff Budland, and he argued the PMTCT case. So you've got 11 judges on the court who are all directly and indirectly affected by HIV AIDS. Either they're brothers, partners, sisters, they'll talk about their nieces, um, their staff members, the people that they know have fallen ill to HIV AIDS and they've died. And then they have the direct experience of people who they know who started taking ARVs and got better. So none of them, I would say, who are sitting on the bench are in any way entertaining any kind of denialist theories. And I think that that's useful. Secondly, they are independent. So the Constitutional Court in particular and the High Court are not prone to any kind of political interference. And that was um, best illustrated by the MTCT case, which unlike other constitutional court judgments where one judge writes the judgment and their name appears on it, you know, Cheskelson or Yakub, and others concur, the MTCT case, because it was so politicized, came out as a unanimous court judgment. Okay. And thirdly, I think that none of these judges are immune to what's happening in, in South Africa. So they all read the papers, they all watch the television, they all see the marches and protests and people around them. During the MTCT case, the court was filled with protesters wearing HIV t-shirts. So, you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's, it's not a judiciary that is removed from, I think, the lived experiences of people. And, you know, there have been lower courts, I mean, to answer your to question, where, where some judges have said some strange things. But because we have an appeal process and because the Constitutional Court is the highest court in the land, we have the benefit of being able to rely on the Constitutional Court and its wisdom and its jurisprudence for that. Uh, in fact, sometimes when you meet judges on the street, they'll say, why don't you bring that prisoner case to us? You know, the moment we're battling the South African government on, on getting access to prisoners, uh, access to treatment for prisoners. So it's something that they're open to and something that they've called the biggest public health crisis in South Africa. And, you know, so I think the jurisprudence is also there to be used. We've got a great constitution. We've entrenched socioeconomic rights, um, great Section 27. So it's easier for them to be able to, to, to rely on some kind of rule of law framework. Catherine? Okay. Um, so you in view of the possibility that Jacob Zuma will become president of South Africa, he won't. Um, or <laughs> someone else. <laughs> um, Fatima, what's your sense about the next generation of leadership in South Africa? Do you anticipate having the same denialist problems that you have now? Mm. I mean, Catherine, I think we're all optimistic to believe two things. One, that Jacob Zuma will not become the next president and one that the next generation of leadership will not be a denialist one. And I say that for two reasons. One is that even though the Deputy Minister of Health was dismissed, 
and nobody publicly challenged President Dimbeki on that. Privately within the ANC, <coughs> there's a lot of dissent and unhappiness with government's response on HIV AIDS. A lot of them are not denied us. In fact, a lot of them are on air with themselves, okay, which is the other kind of irony. Um, and so I think that once you remove President Mbeki from the equation, and with that will be the Minister of Health, because she's not supported by any other health ministers. She's only supported by the President. And incidentally, she's married to the ANC Treasurer General. So the reason why she's in office, or continues to remain in office, despite being an embarrassment to the South African <coughs> government, is not, not only because she's a denialist, but also because she's married to one of the most influential, important persons uh, who knows all the secrets about uh, party funding of the ANC. Okay? The Treasurer General knows exactly who's putting money in and, and who's got money, especially with the arms deal, which has been directly responsible for the fall of, of Jacob Zuma. Um, I think the new leadership, uh, Catherine, is going to be one that's going to be truly, I think the space exists for it to be truly remarkable. If you see how the Deputy President has actually restructured Senec, has uh, brought in civil society and has given very little room in Senec to the Minister of Health to impose her own views, that for me suggests some kind of optimistic, um, you know, outlook. I, I, I don't know. Um, this is why I'm on sabbatical, because I believe <laughs> that nothing's going to change and everything's going to get worse. So maybe we'll have to answer that question in when we have another president. After December. In December, the ANC has its conference, which will determine who its next leader will be. That leader, in all likelihood, will be the next president of South Africa. Unless it's Mbeki who elects himself as the third term of the ANC, then one of his chosen candidates will be the president. So, you know, in December, we'll really know, I think, where the country is going to go generally politically and where the country is going to go on HIV and AIDS. Good question, thank you. Well, um, I'm not sure, maybe this question is going to be too difficult, but I, would be ju I was just interested in your perspective. How, would you, how do you think where to start? Because like, I'm from Russia, so in my country, there's no such thing as AIDS, HIV, um, lawyers or there are uh, maybe one or two uh, human rights organizations, very small, maybe very underfunded. But the problem in my country is not just that our leaders are denial, denialists, it's also that the public generally is afraid of HIV and AIDS. And they, most of them uh, honestly believe that people with HIV and AIDS have to be isolated from the society. Like, really, so it's very, there's a huge discrimination, no treatment, of course, no access to drugs. And uh, if you go to court, I mean, judges are also people. And I can see where they would be very um, reluctant to make judgments in favor mm -hmm. of So what do you think, like, how things can be changed? Like, now where to start yeah. even? I mean, we, we went through exactly that phase. In the first few years of the HIV epidemic in South Africa, we went through intense sort of personal denial. We went through people in parliament who wanted to pass laws to um, what is the word? What Cuba does? <coughs> quarantine. Oh. Uh, it's too late in the afternoon. So basically to quarantine people, to make it compulsory to put AIDS as the reason for your death on a death certificate. And we went through a period where a lot of people were trying to pass laws to actually prevent people living with HIV access employment, medical aid, insurance, you know, a lot of sort of your civil and political rights confidentiality, lots of high levels of discrimination and stigma. And it only changed, and I think it will change in Russia, and I mean, working with a lot of uh, human rights organizations in Russia, we see this happening when HIV AIDS and mortality becomes more visible to people. So when you start having friends and family members who are getting sick, more often than they should be and start dying because of a lack of access to proper health care. That's when the individual denial starts eroding, where people start going to get tested for HIV more early and more regularly. And then, I mean, it's, it's really two things, HIV testing and increasing that and making people aware of what HIV is and doing the education and the literacy. So there were, you know, thousands of people in South Africa in the townships who believed that HIV AIDS was a white gay men's disease. And it was only education and literacy that changed that. There were, there were thousands of people in the township who said, well, President Mbeki said there is no such thing as HIV, so I don't have to use a condom. Or he said that ARVs will kill you and they're toxic, so I'm not going to use these ARVs. So it's a constant, firstly, you need a strong civil society. And in Russia, there's some questions about to, to what extent it's able to operate. 
And secondly, you need a civil society that's willing to educate and, and is willing to provide that, that kind of literacy. I mean, uh, you know, relying on the law is, is, like I said, it's really the last resort. I'm, I'm not too concerned with countries who don't have uh, functioning kind of uh, legal machinery. Sometimes it's better not to go to court because you're going to get a bad precedent. Sometimes you should rather not go to court in some countries. In South Africa, we use the Constitutional Court because it's quite a sort of uh, positive uh, outlook on shaping the jurisprudence. But we also foreign shop. We don't go to some courts because we know the judges there may be a bit conservative. We've had judges who have done that and we've had to appeal them. Um, and I think in Russia in particular, I mean, one of the concerns that Russian activists have been raising is it's a very different epidemic to our epidemic. Ours was largely, boom, in the early 90s, a heterosexual, largely black ep epidemic. Not to say that other communities were not affected, but that was the group that was most, mostly affected. It wasn't really a gay epidemic in South Africa. It wasn't an epidemic linked to sexual orientation. It was everybody across, uh, you know, across kind of sexuality that was affected. And in Russia, one of the problems is around getting the Russian government to agree to recognize that IDUs are probably greatest, so injecting drug users are greatest risk of HIV infection and convincing the Russian government on prevention. And I think that's the key in any country, is the prevention. So needle exchange program, substitution treatment for, for you know, uh, for, for <coughs> drug addicts, which are all kind of controversial issues and they're not sexy issues because you're kind of getting into debates around illicit drug use, but in Poland, that is, you know, they're showing that that's what's working, and, and in other countries, the evidence, again, which is why you have to rely on the evidence, the evidence is showing that with IDU populations, the best way to prevent HIV is to give them clean needles, and so I think prevention is probably, prevention, education, not to see everything <laughs> is, is, is going to be the solution. The other thing that will help with, uh, sorry, just the last thing with South Africa is, and Russian activists are doing this to some extent now, is putting pressure on international donors and other governments to put pressure on the Russian government to admit that there's a problem of HIV AIDS in its country. And that's what worked for South Africa. When they were embarrassed in Durban in 2000, when they were embarrassed in Toronto last year in August 2006, when we had garlic and olives, uh, oil and lemons in, our, in, our, in the South African stall and not ARVs, that's what caused the South African government to act. It was the international embarrassment and how donors would see them because then donors wouldn't put money in. So I think that's, you know, with countries in Eastern Europe, the international pressure is probably quite significant, uh, uh, quite a significant tool. Very interesting. I'm from South Africa myself, working here at Duke now, uh, Medicine. Just had a question. I agree with you in terms of the role of the President's Advisory Council in giving a mixed message as to the etiology of HIV or the, or the cause of AIDS, which I think did cloud those initial um, policy decisions made by, by our president. But my question is, what do you think of the role, again, myopic potentially, of the economic implications and their inability on an economic level to roll out ARVs, fearing what that might do, and compare that to what they felt the vertical child, or sort of mother to child, transmission inhibition might be by giving ARVs that level initially. That was sort of one of the earlier um, earlier pieces of the puzzle. And I'm just wondering what you think the economic implications that they may perceive a general decent rollout to be. You mean as an, as a sort why of they wouldn't scale up? Yes, why, why they are being so reluctant to scale up. OK, well, I mean, the immediate response to that would be it's not about the money. Because the money, and this, this is where alliances with actuaries and economists and, and the research and evidence that we've been able to rely <coughs> on has been to show that South Africa has enough resources in country. We don't even need the resources of the PEPFARs and, and you know, to some extent the Global Fund. We can actually fund the program by ourselves in terms of the revenue we're able to collect. So the National Strategic Plan has been costed the initial phase of about 45 billion rands, which we have. And Treasury, and that's a, you know, it's a great question you ask because Treasury and the Department of Health, and I'll only say this here, have never agreed on anything. Treasury, who works quite closely with us, has always said we have enough money, we just haven't been approached to make the allocation. You know, so it's not uh, unlike other African countries that have to rely on the Gates Foundation and Clinton and Global Fund and PEPFAR. We really in this fortunate position where we have sufficient resources and we are able to implement the program much faster. 
What concerns me is how Rwanda, with so little infrastructure and resources, is able to speed up the program and put more people in treatment in a much shorter space of time in South Africa. And that, to me, suggests that we don't have the political will. And I'll tell you why we don't have the political will. For example, a uh, Minister of Health likes power. So she centralized power in terms of accreditation of clinics. So on paper, it's great. We have over 1,000 clinics that provide ARV treatments, clinics of 3,000. But if you go and look in places where they don't have a clinic and you ask them, well, why aren't you providing ARV treatment? It's because they haven't got the rubber stem from the minister to accredit their facility. And you can only provide ARV treatment if your clinic is accredited. Now, four years into the program, one Minister of Health in her national department is responsible for accrediting clinics in all nine provinces, which requires two visits per year by the accreditation team to every facility to see if you say you've got two chairs and a room and space for counseling, they have to come and see whether you actually have it or not. So that's the one issue. The second issue is on um, treatment guidelines. So something as simple and you know, as, as obvious as changing your guidelines every year to be in line with the WHO guidelines, which were revised last year in August 2006, becomes a political issue. So even though we have the money and we've taken action against drug companies to bring the prices down, we're not using the best regimens or the most effective regimens, both mother to child transmission as well as for pediatric uh, prevention and, and treatment because the guidelines haven't been revised. So if you're in the private sector, you get the best treatment. You're able to prevent a whole lot of more infections and treat current infections much better. In the public sector, we're still waiting for the guidelines to be revised. So it's, it's those kind of things that are the little barriers to scaling up prevention care and treatment and, and money is not the issue there was. You know, at one time there were some rumors that, and I don't know, I mean, you need to tell me because maybe you have a different perspective on, on that, was that um, one of the reasons the South African government was happy not to provide ARV treatment was because they felt, as what traditional economists call, that the right people, if the right people die, it's fine. These are poor, unemployed people who are a burden on government, and if they die, it doesn't really make a dent in the economy and it doesn't really make a dent in terms of productivity levels when you've got a country where 40% of people are unemployed. I think even if there was a semblance of truth in that, that was quite uh, short-lived because at some point they realized that the burden of people dying was actually even poor people dying or people who were not productive in, in the sense that they had a formal job was much harder on the economy because now we have all these child-headed households, we have grandparents who are looking after children, we have an economically active population that has been decimated. You know, the, the highest number of people who are infected are between 25 and 49, and our mortality for the age group 30 to 45 has just spiraled out of control. So I would like to think that it wasn't as, as sinister as that, but you never know. So would I. <laughs> Thank you. But we have the money. We have, in fact, we have lots of money. So uh, just one last point. When the initial campaigning started on South Africa should have a treatment program if Brazil can do it. And by that time, Brazil had put 150,000 people in treatment in 2004. And we said, Brazil can do it. And MSF, Medicine Tom Ventures, can do it in Kailicha, a poor township in Cape Town. Then there's no reason the South African government couldn't do it. And their immediate response was, we don't have the money. It will be too expensive. It's not sustainable. We don't have the resources. So we said, OK, fine. We'll show you that you're wrong. And we worked with a group of actuaries. In fact, Nicolae Natras has just written a brilliant book on, on, on the politics of denialism, which, which you should read in particular. It's called Mortal Combat, which explains why the Mbeki administration went this particular road. And she and, and actuaries from the University of Cape Town worked with the treatment action campaign to provide an objective costing report to say how much it would cost the South African government, given the current prices of medicines and laboratory tests, to provide to start the treatment program. And it was presented to government and the ANC and Treasury and said, well, actually, you're wrong. It, it's actually quite affordable because there's going to be cost savings in, in five to 10 years' time. And that was the report that catalyzed members of the African National Congress and cabinet to make a decision that the Treasury must work with the Department of Health to cost the treatment plan. It's something the Department of Health never wanted because they never wanted to work with Treasury. The treasury had always been saying, this is affordable and we must do it. So it was that report that I think was really the turning point, which is why research 
and evidence is simple. Can I ask a follow up on this one? Yes. The socioeconomic rights um, argument would be yeah, any one particular funding for socioeconomic rights can be afforded, however many millions of dollars it is or rands. But in a country that is poor with a lot of demands on its budget, it's not exactly, for those of us who are really fighting for socioeconomic rights more broadly, it's not exactly true that we have all the money we need for all the socioeconomic rights we want to um, make sure are actually realized. So, so there is a real argument to their trade-offs, right? <laughs> if you're spending this kind of money in one area, you're not spending it in another area. Mm. And how, how do you handle that more sympathetic argument, okay? Not coming from the position of, let's figure out a way not to get our ARVs, mm. but really coming from a, we're part of a bigger program here, and these are socioeconomic rights in general that we need to protect. How do you, how do you manage that money actually is a limit? We, well, legally you manage that by recognizing that the provision in the Constitution around, around socioeconomic rights is that there must be a progressive realization of the right. So when we first started campaigning, we didn't say, by the end of this month, you've got to put a million people on treatment. We said, by the end of this month, you've got to put 20,000 people on treatment, mm -hmm. and by the end of this year, you've got to put 100,000, and then in the following year, another 100, etc. So that with time, you're able to find the resources to make it a sustainable intervention. So our premise is not just about affordability, not just that you can afford to have an ARV program in South Africa, but it, it's sustainable. And it's sustainable because of three things. It's a, oh, sustainable because of, of two things. One, the South African government does have enough resources to, to be able to allocate 45 billion rands or you know, a couple of 100 million rands to the health budget, to the existing health budget, okay? Because they were already allocating substantial resources to the AIDS sort of component of the health budget just in terms of hospitalization and in terms of prevention work. And the, and the second and I think unique aspect of it was that we have a very, very wealthy private sector and a very wealthy not-for-profit sector. So some of the best treatment programs are funded by not only international donors, but by the private sector in South Africa, which makes it sustainable. This, the private sector, after four years of working for them, are not going to stop their treatment program. They want people in the mining sector in particular, Anglo, Anglo okay, the first company to provide the biggest treatment program in South Africa before the South African government did, because they wanted productive, employees who are not getting sick, who are not dying, who are not uh, sustaining injuries in the workplace, and who are happy employees because their wives and their children are getting ARBs as well. And so they get the cost saving of that. And then we had donors who were basically saying, Global Fund, PEPFAR, Medicines on Frontiers, absolute return for kids. It's very sexy to do AIDS work in South Africa. So we had all these donors coming in with resources saying, we'll help you make it sustainable. And so I think because of that anti-apartheid civil society alliances where, where it's okay to sit on this around the same table with the private sector and the Catholic Bishops Conference and the South African Council of Churches, even though we may disagree with them on their views on abortion, termination of pregnancy or condom use, we were able to harness all those resources and really create the momentum to show that the funding was sustainable. And then the other way in which we were able to say, well, the program is sustainable, and, and you can sustainably have it for a long period of time, was to look at the example of Brazil. So we weren't just pulling stuff out of the air. You were able to show Brazil, example. And by putting pressure on drug companies to lower the prices over time, you were able to make the affordability then sustainable on the medicines component. I mean, the next battle is obviously against the roches of the world uh, on, on diagnostics and laboratory testing, because that certainly the pricing is not sustainable. But by putting pressure from all angles and putting pressure particularly on drug companies, because you know, 60% of the HIV bill in South Africa is on drugs. We spend a lot of money on drugs. If you're able to reduce the prices over time and able to manufacture your own drugs and generic versions of it locally, then you're able to bring the prices down. Um, so politically also how we've dealt with that, because we are accused by other activists as being signal issue cam campaigners, we're not worried about housing, or what about water taps, and what about uh, electricity, and what about a whole range of things. And our argument has always been, we recognize every socioeconomic right as being equally important. We recognize that government is not under an obligation to provide everything to everybody overnight, but over time it must, because that's its constitutional obligation. It can't be exempted from its constitutional duties. 
And in the same way that we fight for HIV AIDS treatment, one day we will be fighting for social security, one day we will be fighting for food security, for housing, for water. And, and I think the problem with these sort of criticisms of other activists is that you know, we've managed to get the constitutional jurisprudence and to an extent they haven't. And the, and the space is there for them to use it and, and that's what needs to happen. So it's not just HIV AIDS at the Constitutional Court and, and health that the Constitutional Court has said government has an obligation to provide services on housing it has as well. So there's the famous case of Kruerbom, uh where it said that it must have a reasonable plan and it's going to cost you money, but sorry, go find the money and that's what you must do. You must provide housing. So I hope that answers it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Fatima, very much. I'm sure Fatima will answer any questions you have individually if you want to come yeah. up and meet her. Let's see why she needs a